welcome once again, after a period of one month. I have been closely watching the events unfold in the Middle East after the October 7th attack on Israel by Hamas. Needless to say, such an action would not go without any response by Israel, and therefore it happened. Interestingly, as expected religion has come into play with lots of bias on both sides, so let us see how this can be analyzed. I would be using known historical facts to correct the manipulation by some vested interests. This is that small piece of land called Israel to which the Palestinian Arabs also lay claim to. At this point in time, the Palestinian areas of Israel are split into two parts. One, the West Bank which is the area surrounding Jerusalem, and two, the tiny strip of land towards the south which is called as the Gaza Strip. The rulership of both these Palestinian areas are under different groups. The West Bank is controlled by a more moderate group by name Fatah, but Gaza is controlled by one organization by name Hamas, which has its headquarters in Qatar. The Emir of Qatar, Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, is the primary protector, promoter, and financier of Hamas. The top leaders of Hamas are primarily two people: one, Ismail Haniya, and two, Khalid Mashal. These two are the ones who are enjoying the luxury of the Palace of Qatar and egging the deprived Palestinians to fight against the armies of Israel. Neither of them will ever fight or even send their family to the war-torn Gaza to lead their ideological wars. What surprises me is the response from the common Palestinian. Why are they not asking relevant questions? What have the Hamas leadership done to help the people of Gaza who have voted them to power? Did they know that they would be thrown as fodder for the Israeli army? Did they knew that they would be used as human shields to coerce and manipulate world opinion? Did they really sign up for this? If they do agree to this way of Hamas, they have themselves to blame. But what is not amusing me anymore is the behavior of Muslims across the Islamic world. If they are so concerned for the Palestinians, why don't they allow the Gazans a safe passage to Egypt, which is next door, and save so many lives? Why are they shouting for the Palestinians and not proving it in action by taking them to their own nations? What is the agenda behind such a hypocritical behavior? Watch this protest happening in far-off India, where they are unaffected by any actions of Israel. These people are under some illusion that makes them think that Israel and the West is killing Muslims, and hence they have the moral responsibility to stand up against the Jewish state. But wait, where were they all these while when there are hundreds of thousands of Muslims being killed by Islamic regimes? Don't they have the moral responsibility to protest against the Islamic rulers of Saudi Arabia when so many of them were killed by the Saudi army in Yemen? Why were they silent all these years? Or is that the Yemeni Muslim blood is cheap compared to the Palestinian Muslim blood? Remember that it was not just Saudi Arabia killing Yemeni Muslims. Rather, it was a group of Arab and other Muslim regimes which were butchering and killing the Yemeni Muslims. Listen to this data snippet to know the depth of the carnage on the normal Yemeni. The war in Yemen has killed an estimated 377,000 people through direct and indirect causes. 1. Over 150,000 people have been killed in fighting, including the Saudi-led bombing campaign. 2. Many more have died of hunger and disease in the humanitarian crisis caused by the war. 3. Over 60% of the deaths were due to disruptions in access to food, water, and medicine. And 4. More than 11,000 children are known to have been killed or wounded as a direct result of the fighting. The war in Yemen has also pushed over 16 million Yemenis to the edge of famine. As of March 2022, more than 4 million people have been displaced from their homes. Yemen has long been the Arab world's poorest country, and its humanitarian crisis has been called one of the worst in the world.
For sure, they do not really care if the one killed is a Muslim or not, but they have a bias which is dictated from their books which is the cause of this behavior. In simple terms, the hatred for the Jews, Islam is the religion that promotes anti-Semitism, and hence they feel obligated to follow their religious dictates. Now coming to the Palestinian issue and the erroneous information that is being floated around by vested interests, they show this map of Israel to show how Israel has gradually conquered the Palestinian lands and has rendered them almost homeless. But is this a true fact? Unfortunately, we are ready to gobble up anything that we are fed with. Nobody cares to check the authenticity of what is presented to them. So let us get back to history and see if we are on the right side of history. Needless to say that the Jews inhabited the land we call as Israel today at the time of Christ. That is 2,000 years back. They were conquered by the Romans, and as a result of a rebellion, they were exiled from their ancestral land by the Romans, and hence they got scattered throughout the world. The event of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem caused voluntary dispersal. However, the Romans did forcefully disperse the Jews from Judea, following the Bar Kokhba revolt in 135 AD, 65 years after the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus. The majority of the Jewish population of Judea was either killed, exiled, or sold into slavery. Over a period of time they prospered as a community, and in Europe they primarily gravitated towards the business of money lending. This practice of money lending and charging exorbitant interest on that made them quite a hated community. This hatred grew as time passed, and their business allowed them to prosper materially. This was where anti Semitism took root in Europe and caused the rise of governments which viewed them as an undesirable community. Needless to say, they felt the need to return back to the land of their ancestors, and that is where the rise of Zionist movements started. As a result, the Balfour Declaration came into being. The Balfour Declaration was a public pledge by Britain in 1917, declaring its aim to establish a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. After the end of the World War I, the League of Nations, 1920-1946, was formed. It was the first intergovernmental organization established to promote international cooperation and to achieve international peace and security. It was the predecessor of the United Nations organization, which was formed after the Second World War. Theodore Herzl believed it was very important to gain international and legal recognition of the rights of the Jewish people in Eretz Israel before beginning actual settlement there. This perspective was the basis of the political Zionism movement, of which Herzl was the leader. He continued to pressurize the British regime to come true on their declaration. As a result, the British mandate for Palestine was given by the League of Nations to Great Britain. Let us listen to the purpose of the British mandate that was given by the League of Nations. The British mandate for Palestine was a League of Nations mandate that lasted from 1918 to 1948. The British conquered Palestine from the Ottoman Empire during 1917-18. The mandate was administered under a League of Nations mandate. Unlike other colonies, this mandate aimed to lead the native population to self-government and independence. The mandate required Britain to put into effect the Balfour Declaration's national home for the Jewish people, alongside the Palestinian Arabs, who compose the vast majority of the local population. The mandate committed Britain to develop self-government. However, Palestine never had self-government in any form. It was ruled by the British through the most autocratic of colonial systems, governor, executive council, nominated advisory council, and no legislative council. The mandate was the outcome of several factors, including 1. The British occupation of territories previously ruled by the Ottoman Empire. 2. The peace treaties that brought the First World War to an end. And 3. The principle of self-determination that emerged after the war. And then what did Britain do? As usual, they always think politics more than ethics, 
and that is the reason their actions are paying them back when their nation is being dominated by immigrants. In this case, they took the eastern part which was called as Transjordan and gave it to the Arabs to be ruled by the Hashemite king. Now with this action, it was assumed that the Palestinian Arabs would be holding the Transjordan area, while the Jews should be logically given the area west of Jordan. But did that happen? What happened was that the Britain shortchanged the Jews. The Jews of Transjordan area was a very prosperous and innovative community. The world-famous drip irrigation mechanism of Israel is actually an innovation of the Jews who lived in Transjordan much before the beginning of the World War. They grew agro-farms in the arid conditions of the land and produced multifold returns from their cultivation. However, the local Arabs would just feed off from the hard work of the Jews, they had absolutely no desire to develop and be prosperous. So when the Palestinian Jews of the Transjordan area left all their land and properties to make the painful shift to the west of Jordan, the Palestinian Arabs of the west to Jordan River did not reciprocate as they were used to living off their neighbors' wealth and innovations. The same attitude continues to this day. All that they know is to fight and quarrel. As a community, they have been deprived by their culture from a forward-looking outlook. While Britain dilly-dallied on the mandate to declare the Jewish state of Israel, the immigration to the land of Israel by the Jews of Transjordan and other parts of the world continued. At this point the Second World War started and the Holocaust happened under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, causing a huge wave of compassion for the Jews by the end of the Second World War. And that is when the United Nations Organization was formed, and they took it upon themselves to ensure a homeland for the Jews. And in the 14th of May 1948, the Jewish state of Israel was formed in the land of Palestine towards the west of Jordan River. At that point the Jewish population in the land was 716,000, while the non-Jewish population was about 156,000. The Jews were 82% of the total population. Given that scenario, how justified is it to show this made-up map to give an illusion that the majority people of the land was Arabs as is being claimed by certain vested interests? The Arabs were already given their fair share in the Transjordan area, which is called by the name of Jordan now. There is another subtle lie which is making rounds, and that is very clear from these maps. The Arabs living in the land has taken upon them the name Palestinian upon themselves. This is a gross misrepresentation. Anybody who can trace their belonging to this land can be identified as a Palestinian irrespective of your racial or religious affiliation. The word Palestine was given by none other than the Romans to identify this piece of land. It is a Roman word. It has got no connection with any Arab ancestry. In fact, the letter P, as in Palestine, is not there even in any Arab vocabulary. The Arabs spell P as B because the word P is absent in their alphabet. So there is no way an Arab can lay claim to the word Palestine. At best, they can call it as Palestine with a B. Now let me put in another aspect of the migration issue. As I mentioned earlier, that the Jews of Transjordan had to leave their land and possessions to come over to the west of Jordan to their homeland when the British announced the inauguration of the Kingdom of Jordan to the east of the River Jordan. Do you know that the land that the Jews had in their possession was bought by their hard-earned money? This action of the British caused heavy financial, emotional, and material loss to the Jews of Transjordan. Unlike how many Muslims goes to the Western world as refugees, the Jews did not come there as a burden to the people of the land. Their ancestors held that land from which they were evicted, and then they are forced to purchase the same land from the occupants who took over the land when they were exiled. With this background in mind, let us look into a totally new aspect of this Jewish migration from Transjordan to Israel. As it was well understood by the Arab Muslims that they might have to accept a solution with a Jewish neighbor, they wanted to thwart it. For that purpose, many Arab Muslims from Transjordan also migrated to the west of Jordan, along with the Jews, 
so that the population demography can be manipulated to claim the remaining land, as there were no effective border control by Britain, these people could freely come to the west of Jordan. A good portion of those Palestinian Arabs in today's Israel are the descendants of those who migrated from Transjordan. So now we have this mixed community in the land of Israel, or Palestine as the Arabs call it. We also are aware that the Arabs are unwilling to live in the same country with the Jews. So ideally what should be the solution to this problem? To a common person like me, the simple solution is to bifurcate the land based on population concentration and divide the land. Now the most interesting thing about this solution is that the Jews accept a two-state solution, whereas the Arabs do not accept a two-state solution. Most politicians are unaware that the Jews have no problem with the two-state solution. Hence, they keep calling out for a two-state solution, assuming that will appease the Palestinian Arabs. Let us have a look at the different partition plans, which was proposed and was rejected by the Arabs. In 1937, the Peel Commission report suggested a trilateral agreement where the Jews would get only 25% of the remaining land after the Transjordan was removed. It also made sure that the city of Jerusalem would be governed by Britain. From a Jewish point of view, this partition plan was a gross deception. Still, the Jews went ahead and agreed to that. But it was the Arabs who did not agree to this plan as well. Then came the Palestine Partition Commission in 1939 under the leadership of Woodhead, and look at the three proposals he put up. Notice Plan C at the extreme right, where the Jews would not even get 10% land. And do you know the outcome of the plan? Yes, the Jews accepted it, and the Arabs rejected it. Now that when Britain is stuck with the Arabs not accepting any of their solution, they included the Americans in their effort and formed the Anglo-American Committee of Enquiry. The Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry, AAC, was formed in 1945 to address the Arab-Jewish conflict in Palestine and the European Jewish refugees in DP camps. The committee was made up of six British and six U.S. investigators. We need to keep in mind that the Americans and the Britishers had their own commercial interests in the oil fields of Arabia. They somehow gave a report that Jews from all over the world can come to this land only if they have enough money to purchase land for themselves. They forbid Jews from coming into the land as refugees. They proposed a land for the Jews which was 25% of the available land while over 70% went to the Arabs. And do you know who accepted it and who rejected the proposal? Bingo. The Jews accepted it and the Arabs rejected it. We have come to the end of this first portion of the topic. We shall continue with the analysis in our later episodes. Till we meet again, may the good Lord bless you and keep you.